Hi guys, Miss Marusik here, and in this video we're going to be talking about writing free response answers to questions where we are having to justify one of these four properties, melting point, boiling point, volatility, or vapor pressure. So to start us off here, we have this lovely comparison chart where they give us kind of a scale of high to low ends of our four different properties. Now, up here at the top, they've given us our four different types of attractions. Um, first off, ionic, metallic, and network covalent are kind of grouped together here because remember for all of those, we are breaking bonds when we are transitioning between a solid, liquid, and gas. Um, then we have our hydrogen bonding intermolecular forces, dipole-dipole intermolecular forces, and our line of dispersion intermolecular forces. Um, so on strength of attraction, of course, as expected, our bonds would be the highest strength on those attractive forces. And then they have ranked here our intermolecular forces from low to high strength. Now I will warn you, uh, London dispersion forces can kind of sometimes be an oddball because if we have a big enough electron cloud where we have a lot of total electrons in a really big molecule, um, that can actually cause a really polarizable electron cloud where the London dispersion forces can actually be stronger than the hydrogen bonding or dipole-dipole forces in a much smaller molecule. So we have to be careful there on London dispersion forces. We sometimes see um, exceptions to the trend. Um, however, I will warn you, if you have an exception to the trend, you will probably be given some some data to let you know that you do have an exception to the trend on your hands. So you wouldn't have to predict that anomaly in the trend yourself. All right, so to rank here our melting and boiling points, hopefully we remember that if our strength of attractions are really high, then we should have our highest melting and boiling points here, meaning our lowest would be predicted to be with London dispersion forces. Again, there's anomalies to that trend, but in general, this would be your trend from high to low. All right, also we have volatility and vapor pressure, but we've gotta be careful on these. Um, volatility is the ease of evaporation, so how easily does it separate and change over to a gas? Um, and then vapor pressure is related to evaporation and the fact that it's the pressure exerted by the gas that's coming off the surface of a liquid as that evaporation is taking place. So for both of those, if my molecules are weakly held together, then that means they're going to be able to separate and evaporate off. So for both of these trends, my highest end would actually be predicted on our London dispersion side, whereas our lowest values for these two would be where I have the strongest attractive forces. So we gotta be careful there because volatility and vapor pressure do work opposite that of melting point and boiling point as far as those trends are concerned. Now it gives us down here some steps for successfully answering free response questions about intermolecular forces. Now, theoretically, you could use this for IMFs or you could use this for bonds, depending on what you have present. But the first thing you would want to do is if you see a question that's asking you, hey, who's got the higher volatility? Or, hey, justify why this substance has a lower vapor pressure. If you saw something along those lines, what you would first want to do is identify all of your attractions or forces present in both substances. Um, are there bonds or IMFs present? If there's IMFs present, do we have hydrogen bonding, dipole-dipole, linen dispersion? Which ones do we have? And then we would want to state which one has the greater and weaker attractions and explain why. Now, obviously, if we have different attractive forces, then that's pretty easy. Like if I have bo bonds in one substance and I have only forces in another, then, you know, the bonds being stronger type of attractions would be, um, you know, the stronger um, attractive forces and we would have see higher melting and boiling points then. However, if we have IMFs, I could do that same thing. If I have hydrogen bonding forces present in one substance, whereas I only have London dispersion in another, then the thing that has higher attractive forces, the hydrogen bonding, I would expect that to have my stronger attractions and my higher melting and boiling point values. However, let's say 
that I don't have different forces. Let's say I have two substances that both have hydrogen bonding present. Then we can use the number of sites where hydrogen bonding can occur. Maybe in one substance, there's only one area that could do hydrogen bonding with another molecule, but in a different substance, it has two. The one that has two locations could have double the positions for hydrogen bonding, and so therefore those attractive forces would be stronger in those molecules. All right, if they both have one dispersion forces, or if all the types are the same and you're trying to figure out, well, which one would be stronger or weaker here, then we can use number of electrons and polarizability. So as a reminder, as my number of electrons increases, that increases the polarizability of the electron cloud and that gives us those stronger London dispersion forces. Let's say though they have both London dispersion forces or again, if all types of forces are the same, but we also see that the number of electrons are the same. So then I can't use just the number of electrons to justify it. So that's where I have to look to see if maybe I have some structural isomers where I have the same formula, but a different structure. If that's the case, then what we check for is surface area of those molecules. Remember, longer chains are more polarizable because they have more surface area on those long chains. And so then that would lead to stronger London dispersion forces. Now, one kind of quirky thing that we could see is sometimes you are given data that contradicts these predictions. And if that's the case, if you're having to justify why results are not what you expect them to be, then most likely it's due to having strong London dispersion forces due to having a great number of electrons and a high polarizability. So just keep in mind, sometimes you have to watch out for those ones where you're having to justify a trend that you wouldn't have necessarily predicted. Okay. Then, as always, at the end of your justification, you want to relate the strength of attractions back to the property, like say, hey, if I have stronger attractive forces, then that means I should have a higher boiling point or maybe a lower volatility, whatever the case may be. And then you want to make sure to address an answer to any question posed. If it said, hey, which is the substance that has the higher boiling point? Then somewhere in your statement, you better include this molecule has the higher boiling point. Make sure to answer that question very clearly. So with that said, let's look at some examples on the next page. Now, some of these I'm going to let you try out. A few of these we're going to talk about together. Um, but I want to kind of give you an idea of how I would approach one of these. Um, so that way you have a good idea of kind of where to get going on these. So on the first example here, it says, hey, would sodium chloride NaCl or water be predicted to have higher melting and boiling points and justify your decision? So the first thing I would want to do is for both of these substances, I want to identify what kind of attractive forces hold them together as a solid. Um, so for NaCl, I say to myself, well, hey, that's an ionic compound. So that means that's held together by ionic bonds. So I'm not going to identify London dispersion or dipole dipole or whatever on NaCl because it has ionic bonds present. Okay, that's what I would break when I melt or boil it. For water, on the other hand, hopefully we remember that water being covalent would have London dispersion forces. Being polar would have dipole dipole forces. And because I have hydrogen bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, in this case to oxygen, I would also have hydrogen bonding forces. Now for right now, I just kind of abbreviated those just to jot me down some notes of what I have. So that, that way then I could go and reason out why one has different melting or boiling points than the other before I actually write my answer here. And so I say to myself, well, hey, if in NaCl I'm breaking bonds, but in water, I'm only breaking forces, then in NaCl, I should have higher melting and boiling points. Really, I didn't even have to identify my intermolecular force types here. Just knowing that water only would be breaking intermolecular forces would be sufficient here to answer this question. So this is what I would have put for this one. To melt and boil NaCl, ionic bonds must be broken. To melt and boil H2O, intermolecular forces must be broken. So notice I took the time for both of my substances to identify what kind of attractions exist that 
I would need to break in order to use this property. Okay, as bonds require more energy to break than intermolecular forces, NaCl would require more energy to melt and boil. And so here's where I answer the question. Notice I underlined it. So NaCl will have higher melting and boiling points. I wanted to make sure to answer that question of which one is predicted to have higher melting and boiling points with a very clear statement that NaCl will have the higher melting and boiling points. We want to clearly answer that question. All right, let's look at another one. Would ammonia NH3 or liquid phosphine PH3 be predicted to have a higher vapor pressure? Justify your decision. Well, let's talk about these for a moment. Ammonia NH3, I'm going to kind of actually sketch it out here really quick. First off, I know it is covalent. And so therefore, I would not be breaking bonds, but rather IMFs here. Um, I know being covalent, I would have London dispersion forces present. Um, I see it's very polar. Okay, and so therefore I would have dipole dipole forces present. And then I see hydrogen bonded to nitrogen. So since I have that bond, this could then form hydrogen bonding intermolecular forces to another molecule. So I'm also going to have hydrogen bonding forces present here with other molecules. So then I'm going to do the same thing with the phosphine. So I'm going to draw him out as well. He looks something like so. All right, so again, it's covalent. So again, I'm like, hey, I know I have London dispersion forces present. He is polar. I can see he's very unsymmetrical, so my bond dipoles would not cancel out here. So I know I have dipole-dipole forces. But I don't see hydrogen bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. I have hydrogen present, but it's not bonded to one of my three special elements. And so therefore, I don't have that extra type here. So if I'm thinking about a higher vapor pressure here, to have a higher vapor pressure means that more of it is evaporating to a gas. And so that means I would want much weaker forces in order to get more transitioning over to a gas. So here's what I would have put as my answer. I would have first said, hey, ammonia has London dispersion forces, dipole, dipole, and hydrogen bonding forces present. Phosphine only has London dispersion and dipole, dipole forces present. So again, I took the time to clearly identify what kind of forces both of those substances have. You want to make sure that is your first step. So then, since phosphine has weaker overall forces, because we don't have hydrogen bonding, it will evaporate more easily to form more gas. And so here is my final claim for my answer to my question. Phosphine will have the higher vapor pressure. So again, I want to make sure I make that claim very clear somewhere in my statement. All right, on the next one here, it says, hey, would you expect hexane or dimethylbutane to have a higher vapor pressure at 25 degrees Celsius? Justify your decision. And upon first glance at both of these, I'm like, okay, well, they're both covalent. I both only have nonmetal combinations here and it's not the network covalent like it's not a never-ending network here so both of these are going to have London dispersion forces present and then I look at these and I say well hey they're both just carbon hydrogen chains there's no oxygens or nitrogens or anything else in there so both of these being nonpolar London dispersion forces are the only type I have present that's it so then I ask myself okay well Let's see if the number of electrons is maybe different in these two. Since I have the same types of forces, the next thing I would check are those total number of electrons. Well, here I have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. Here I have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. Okay, so carbon counts are the same. Let's see if hydrogen counts are the same. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay. So 3, 6, 9, 12, 13, 14 hydrogens. Oh, we have the same counts of everything. So number of electrons are the same. So remember, the last resort I kind of have with London dispersion forces is that I can use branching to answer this. So take a moment, pause the video, and see if you can write me a justification as to which of these formulas might have the higher vapor pressure and give me a reason why. So try pausing the video and try writing something out. All right, did you pause it? Did you write something down? I sure hope you did. All right, I'll go ahead and show you what I wrote. So again, as always, 
I identified what kind of forces were present. I said, hey, both of them have London dispersion forces present and the same count of electrons. But then here's where I said, hey, dimethylbutane has more branching and less surface area. So as we talked about last class, that means that dimethylbutane has a less polarizable electron cloud and decreased temporary dipole moments. We don't see as much of that shifting occur in the electron cloud when it's all more clumped together versus in a chain. And so if I get decreased temporary dipole moments, that leads to weaker forces and more ease in evaporating to a gas. So here's my concluding statement. Dimethylbutane will have the higher vapor pressure. All right, let's do one last one here. It says, hey, in terms of the types and relative strengths of all the IMFs present in each compound, explain why the boiling point of CCl4 is higher than that of PF3. So to start us off here, I'm going to go identify my intermolecular force types. And for CCl4, I'm like, okay, well, that's covalent, so I know I'm going to have London dispersion forces present. And then I'm like, well, hey, all those bond dipoles cancel out. That's a pretty symmetrical molecule there. So that means it's going to be nonpolar. And if it's nonpolar, then that would mean that Len dispersion forces are my only type. I don't have any other type there. So then for this one, I would say, okay, well, again, covalent. So again, Len and dispersion forces. Here, though, it's polar. That unshared electron pair at the top causes the bond dipoles to not cancel out, and it causes that molecule to be unsymmetrical. So therefore, here, I would also have dipole-dipole forces. However, I would not have hydrogen bonding present. And so when I look here, I would say, well, hey, this guy's got more forces, so that should probably have stronger attractions. And then I notice the boiling points, and I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. Even though this has more forces, this is a lower boiling point. That doesn't quite make sense. We see an anomaly to our expectations. And if that's the case, remember what is probably going to cause our big difference here. That's right, everybody's favorite, number of total electrons and polarizability. Compare your molecules here for just a second. Carbon and phosphorus are pretty close to each other on the periodic table, so they have close to the same count of electrons. Um, but chlorine has significantly more electrons than fluorine does. They're in the same group, but chlorine's one more period down. And so this one's going to have a lot more total electrons than this guy here does. But notice, they didn't ask us to predict that anomaly. They gave us some data here to let us know that this is an exception to our rule. We just have to justify why it's an exception to our traditional trends of melting and boiling points. All right, so with that said, take just a moment here and see if you can write me some sort of statement here that helps to explain our point. So see if you can make a concluding statement here. All right, did you pause the video? Did you try it out? I hope you did. I hope you weren't just waiting for me to put up my answer, but I'm gonna go ahead and put up my answer here. All right, so here's what I wrote. Oops. I wrote, first off, that CCL4 has only London dispersion forces present, while PF3 has both London dispersion and dipole-dipole forces. So again, as always, I identified my types of attractions that were present. But then I got to give a reason why this guy has the higher boiling point. So here's where I said CCL4 has more total electrons, meaning a more polarizable electron cloud. And as we talked about the other day, all of our next statements that we make increase temporary dipole moments and London dispersion forces that are stronger than the combo of forces that we have in PF3. So because that London dispersion force on its own is stronger than the combination of London dispersion and dipole-dipole for this other one, the CCL4 would have a higher boiling point. All right, hopefully we're feeling confident with being able to write some uh, free response answers for these types of questions. You're going to get lots of practice with this over the next couple days. Um, so by the end of this, you're going to feel like experts when it comes to these explanations. Um, if you have any questions or need any help, please feel free to email me. Bye, guys.